So thank you for uh, being here this afternoon. Um, uh, so I'm Martin Geddes. Uh, I run my own little consulting company, um, helping operators and various other parts of the ecosystem to wring out the maximum possible from telecom networks. So my talk is about how to turn networking, or particularly network performance, um, from a highly numerate and skilled craft into absolute rock-hard science. And I wanted to open my presentation with this little quote. And the quote is from the, uh, the billionaire uh, shipping magnate, Aristotle Onassis. And he said, the secret of success is to know something nobody else knows. Okay. And so I'm going to share it secret with you today, okay? And it's the, it's the secret that we've been carrying, which is um, uh, the, the new mathematics that enables um, uh, the, the, the science of network performance. So, uh, I work alongside these gentlemen here, uh, Dr. Neil Davis and Peter Thompson. So, Neil has a background in uh, supercomputing and safety critical systems, and Peter has a background in quantum physics, and also he was a designer of the, the transputer. So yeah, highly parallel uh, uh, systems. And I'm kind of the, I'm, I'm the storyteller. Um, so I help take the, their brilliance and bring it out into the world. Now, uh, why should you believe any of what I'm about to tell you? Well, we've had a number of um, uh, firsts. We built the, the world's first ever quality assured ISP. Um, my colleagues have built um, the world's first sort of um, uh, X-rays for telecom networks. So very uh, high resolution, high fidelity images of what's going on inside networks. And we do work for, for, for regulators, for operators, um, for governments. Um, we also kind of do some exotic stuff for the military or getting data out of the, the super colliders at CERN. So, what I wanted to do was uh, reflect for a moment on the, the nature of the, the transition we're in in our network, networking world. So we're at a, an inflection point um, where we've been building um, uh, networks for packet networks for 30 or 40 years. And we're now trying to achieve levels of performance that are previously unheard of. And it's a little bit like the transition in aviation where we went from um, turboprop aircraft to jet aircraft. And you couldn't just strap a jet engine onto an old turboprop aircraft. You had to build a whole new system. And this is a picture of the Comet 1, okay, which is the first commercial jet airliner. And it had a rather unfortunate history. So the first um, Comets went into service, into passenger service, and the passengers didn't realize they were really riding on top of an experimental airplane. And, and some of them found out the very hard way. Um, and the reason these aircraft fell out of the sky was that we didn't understand the dynamic properties of the materials we're working with. So you see there's these square windows, and they started to get metal fatigue from the pressurization, depressurization. So there was, there was cracks in the corners, and, and the, the plane started to fall apart. Okay. So there was a, um, uh, a performance envelope for that, that machine so if it had only ever flown below, say, 10,000 feet, and hadn't got pressurized, that, that problem wouldn't have occurred. But the moment you started to fly at 20,000, 30,000 feet, pressurization, depressurization caused it to fail. It caused it to fail in operation in a way that, that destroyed lives. Um, now, in what we're trying to do in our telecom world is we're trying to advance the state of the art. And somewhere out there, there's a state of the possible. There's one state of the possible that's imposed by the laws of physics. So, for example, in the wireless world, we're getting close to the Shannon limit. Yeah, so there's not much more we can do. Um, but in the world that Jane was talking about, with the world of uh, distributed computing, particularly sort of this very spatially distributed computing, the state of the art and the state of the possible are a long way apart, actually much further apart than you realize. But the problem is, is that we're trying to um, uh, advance the state of the art and we're not, we're not taking account of some of these um, uh, dynamic stress properties of our networks. So we're trying to uh, do RAN sharing, we have packets which are creating more variability, um, we're having um, much more dense networks, so there's much more uh, dynamic effects from people moving from small cell to small cell to small cell. So just like with the aircraft, we're in entering a, a more and more dynamic environment and the stresses that it's placing on our systems are starting to exceed the engineering capabilities that we have. 
So, my thesis for this talk is that success in 5G requires a new way of thinking about networks. It requires reconceptualizing what we're doing. So we have to, to take on board what you might call some, some new thinkware before we can advance with new hardware and software. And there's one key idea I want you to walk away from this, um, this presentation, which is this idea that there's, a, there's a, um, a mathematics of this, and we call it delta Q. So delta Q is the core new idea that has enabled us to do network performance science. And it requires us to think about networks in a subtly different way. So a little, little reframing. So most of the time, we think about networks as doing something positive. They give us bandwidth. They move packets. But the way that we look at the network is different. We see networks as being machines that just attenuate quality. The only thing a network does is lose and delay stuff. The only observable effect of a network is to impair. Yeah? The only product we have as a telecom industry is disappointment. But luckily, that disappointment is bounded from the bottom. Okay? So, um, so delta Q is a measuring metric of this disappointment that we produce. Okay, so that's, that's the, the strange paradox. It's the Alice in Wonderland, step through the mirror and see the world from the other side that you have to engage with in order to get a, a rational engineering and mathematics of this space. So let's unpack that thought for just a little moment. Um, so a network is a, a resource. There's a supply. There's a certain amount of spectrum we've bought. There's a certain amount of compute power we have in that, that software telco. Um, there's a certain amount of um, uh, you know, ability to execute the code space. Um, th there's various constraints we have, you know, there's backhaul. So there's a, there's a resource supply we have. And then, of course, there's a resource demand. You know, users want to run applications, and different applications have different levels of demand. They have different needs for um, the timeliness of the data and different needs for the quantity of the data and its resilience. And then in the middle, we have a resource trading space. So in how we do all our packet scheduling and the code space on the uh, provisioning, um, we're trying to match those, that supply and demand, all time scales. And as we do that matching, it's naturally a, a quantitative process. We have to somehow quantify the demand and quantify the supply and make resource allocation choices. And the way we typically do that today is using metrics like bandwidth or jitter. Um, and what I'm trying to tell you is that those metrics are really unhelpful. And actually, there's one metric to rule them all. And this is the only possible metric which has the properties we require, which is it is both a network performance measure and also simultaneously a strong proxy for the customer experience. And no other metric we ever come up with will ever have that property. So, um, so again, to the high level, this is the thesis. To turn networking from a skilled craft, so not, not trying to dismiss what people are doing, but into a rock hard science, what you need to do is you need to change the model you have of the very nature of the resource. And there's three reasons for that. The first reason is that the current metrics we're using have very low fidelity. So we take these averages, you know, like a five-minute average utilization of a network element, and we do capacity planning based on that. Unfortunately, those averages have hidden all of the, the fine-grained detail that actually matters. And that leads us to um, uh, misengineer our systems. We, we assume they have a performance envelope, which is in a different place to where it actually is, just like with that Comet air aircraft. So we end up accidentally designing systems that are infeasible. And we, we've worked on such projects, several of them. So an example of that would be for the US military, where we, we proved that um, future combat systems, a $300 billion project, was infeasible after having spent $30 billion on it. The second reason why you need to change the resource model is that, um, uh, is that you can uh, compose and decompose this delta Q thing. It gives you what every other engineering discipline has, which is the ability to, to budget some kind of performance. So if you're building a, a building like this one here, um, there's a certain weight it has to, to withstand. And, uh, and you can model the, the concrete and the girders and the glass and add up those weights. And, and, and you can decompose them into the individual elements. If you're building an aircraft, you know, there's someone in charge of the total weight of the aircraft, and you have a budget for weight. 
what we've lacked is a budget for performance. So what we can do is we can look at the, the quality attenuation that every element is introducing and have an overall budget and see how it decomposes into all the individual elements. So that gives you predictable QoE and cost. Big, big deal. Um, the third reason why Delta Q is interesting is that, as I said, networks are, are really resource trading platforms. They're not pipes at all. Um, and, it, and it lets you make some ways the, the optimum resource trades at all those timescales. So it lets you extract the maximum possible value out of the network by um, uh, making the best possible trades you could be doing, re re reallocating resources. So I'm going to go through a little bit about what this Delta Q is and why these things are a big deal. So what is this Delta Q thing? Um, uh, it's a fundamental conceptual advance. And it's a bit of a surprise, because you know, our industry is not a new one. You know, how can people be making fundamental advances at this stage? Well, no, it is a fundamental advance. It's a, an idea akin to, say, the invention of the, the concept of zero, or imaginary numbers. Um, and this advance is one that sits underneath probability theory. So we've tended to use the mathematics of physical objects and queuing theory for, um, for packets. And that turns out to be a bit problematic because packets don't work like physical things. They can be broken up and subdivided. They can be erased and recreated at no cost. Um, so what delta Q is, is a, an extension of the mathematics of probability theory to include non-terminating processes. So if I'm rolling a dice, normally, it lands somewhere, it, you know, the process of rolling the dice terminates, and it comes up with a number. Yeah? And probability theory will let me reason about how the dice is weighted and those numbers. What happens if I roll the dice and it never arrives? Yeah. So what we have now is a, is a new mathematics which tries to unify, or does unify, um, uh, in, the, in the networking domain, loss and delay into a single phenomenon. So rather than trying to model those through two separate sets of metrics, we have one metric space which captures both aspects. Um, and delta Q is also it's a morphism. So a morphism is a, a model which has many layers of abstraction. And because we, we frame the whole world in terms of um, impairments or disappointment, um, what we're doing is we're looking at, at how the disappointment accumulates in the network and how that disappointment at various levels of abstraction relates to the disappointment the customers experience. Okay? So we, we can't satisfy all possible demands at all times to everyone uh, at what a finite cost. Um, so so we're, we're engaging with this sort of slightly strange paradox of, of a world which is reframed around impairment and disappointment. Um, but because it's, because it's got the same framing, and we can use the uh, same mathematical language at every stage, that enables the kind of reasoning processes that, that other engineering disciplines take for granted and we've been struggling with. So this framework comprises three things. The first one is delta Q metrics. Let me show you some examples of, of measures and metrics and the difference it makes. The second one is an algebra. So just like uh, you know, the weights of the objects in this building, um, you can add the weights together. You can add, and, you, know, you can convolve or add um, delta Q, whereas things like bandwidth and jitter don't have that property. Okay, so we can add and subtract it. And the third thing is a calculus, which lets us do what if type calculations and ask what is the boundary of the feasible versus the infeasible. So, some examples. Um, how do we measure this delta Q thing? Well, we measure it differently to the way that we measure um, network networks today. So what we do is we inject um, test packets into networks, these little golden packets, so we don't observe any customer data. And those packets pass by multiple probing points, depending on what spatial resolution you want to get for what's going on in the network. And the packets hit some reflector and come back. And we capture the timing data um, of those packets passing all those points. And then a bit like a, a CAT scan or MRI scan for a human body, um, you reconstruct a, an image in space and time of what's going on inside the network. So give you some, some idea of that. So if you take, say, you know, the, the, the packet size, and plot it against the delay of a packet. Um, not surprisingly, bigger packets take longer. Yeah? But there's a structure here. And we, we have um, if you take a hypothetical zero-length packet going through an empty network. You know, that gives you the, the, in, the geographic delay from the speed of light and all the router lookup overheads. And you have a packet serialization delay, because packets have length. And you have some variable contention delay. 
And that lets us separate out the dynamic effects of a network from the static effects of a network. Right? So we can start to decompose our engineering problems. Um, what's also interesting is that these, these three separate bases, they, they add up. So you can add up the, the Gs, you can add up the Ss, and add up the, the Vs al along any set of network elements. Um, and that, that seems like a trivial property, but actually it's, that's vital and profound, because without it, you haven't got any rational mathematical basis in which to, to compose and decompose your performance problem. You know, the, most, the most basic element of engineering is missing. So to give you some concrete data, um, so we did some work for Kent Public Service Network, um, and unlike most of the oper operators we work with, they've, they've been happy to let us publish this. Um, and they wanted to, um, uh, they wanted to know, could, could we safely run voice over IP over this network? And it's a very well-run network. Um, so we took here at uh, some data over a five-day period. Okay? And the first set of data is the standard network measure you use today. So it's the five-minute utilization of a network element. Um, and as you can see, every five days, there's your typical diurnal pattern. Um, the second set of data we took was from measuring delta Q, like this. And it's a synthetic metric. So delta Q is a universal QoE proxy. And from it, you can, d you can derive the, the risk of failure of any application. So in this case, we've taken voice. There's a certain budget for voice overall. And we've got, there's a budget for this one link. Um, and we've created a, a synthetic metric, which is how at risk is a voice phone call of failing uh, as a result of this, as a result of the, the loss and delay occurring over this link. Okay. And again, there's a pattern. Yeah, you can see over a couple of days. We compare these two. And although they, there is a correlation, there are some really important differences. So for example, in every evening, the network is running hot, and your capacity planning rules will be saying, upgrade, upgrade. Yeah, the, the customer experience is at risk. But you actually look, the customer experience isn't at risk. Yeah, so we're spending billions on networks today upgrading for no reason whatsoever. Um, conversely, there's times in the middle of the night um, where the load is less than 0.1%. So we've over-provisioned it by a factor of 10,000. But the customer experience is at risk. So there's just, there's just the right-wrong pattern of, of arrival which is causing a queue to build up. Um, so what we've kind of got, this is where I, I try to tell people, is like, uh, my network performance science glasses is, is on raw. I'm suddenly a network performance scientist. I can see, through one eye, I can see the network. And through the other eye, I can see the customer experience. And the two of them exactly, over, you know, exactly match. Right, so I, for the first time, I can see the network and the customer experience in the same image. Um, right. So there is a difference. Yeah, there, is a, there is a manifest difference which has a business value um, between these two ways of looking at the network. So that's, that's measurement. The second thing we do with this is modeling. Um, so the original problem that Dr. Davis was working on 20 something years ago was where do I put the, commute, uh, put the compute and when do I communicate, which is the very problem that James was talking about. Thought that this would be in the, the, the literature somewhere. The answer must be already out there. No, it wasn't. Um, and, and as a result, had to invent a whole new branch of mathematics in order to answer the problem. Um, so the kind of issues that you're going to face in 5G um, is you have this super highly dynamic environment where you're trying to virtualize everything, and there's a, an enormous amount of ver variability of performance. Um, and, uh, and you have to decide in, in that where the optimal place for every function is going to be. And you have to, when you've made that decision, you have to also understand the load limit you can tolerate given that, that particular configuration and keep the whole system within that load limit. Um, so you need to have a very accurate model of uh, how this thing will perform. And because the metrics that we're using as an industry don't match the materials, those models are inaccurate. And therefore, the forecasts of how much load we can tolerate on you know, 5G systems will be wrong. Um, so, and we've, we've really watched this happen on previous generations as well. Um, so. Uh, so there's a need to be able to model this. And the essence, the core of being able to model it is a, an agreement, a contract, okay, which is um, uh, some way of expressing the, the semantics of demand. And that includes uh, up to uh, some kind of uh, load ceiling. You know? So you can't, you can't satisfy unbounded demand. So demand has to be, be capped in some way. And then as long as demand is within that load ceiling, there's, there's, a, there's a quality floor. So the quality delivered will be above, above some floor. 
So we're trying to capture an engineering requirement here um, in, the, in the language of Delta Q, um, just like engineers in other uh, domains capture a demand requirement and then match supply to it. And that language of quality contracts um, is stochastic. You know, our materials are stochastic, so we need to work with stochastic um, thinking processes. So, um, so as long as my cumulative distribution function is to the left of some, some contract level here, I'm fine. You know, if it clips these corners, I have a problem. And that chart you saw earlier from KPSN, it was using how much does this, does this clip the corner to tell us how about risk the, um, uh, the, the application was a failing. Um, so when we modeled, for example, future combat systems, um, uh, we captured the requirement that the military had for various things to happen or not happen, um, encoded it into these quality contracts, you know, QTAs as we call them, the quantitative timeliness, timeliness agreements, um, and looked at the, the budget and looked at what the, the resource was, and the demand budget was bigger than the resource. It was not feasible. Um, hence, you know, hence, hence it got cancelled. Now, so that's you know, the measuring, modeling. Third thing is manipulating. So networks are not pipes. No? Networks are not pipes. They are um, resource trading platforms, and they're more like um, uh, derivatives trading platforms or foreign currency futures platforms. Um, and they're making resource trades at all time scales. So when you give a resource to one user, you don't give it to someone else, and you transfer the, the disappointment around. And, we, and we're, what we're doing is trying to put the disappointment in its least damaging place. Right, so, so the coverage in that field outside is probably pretty poor if you wanted to have thousands of people there. But that's fine, because that disappointment of bad coverage for thousands of people is unlikely to cause anyone to get upset. So a very long time scale, so things like capacity planning and provisioning, and then like 10 to 10,000 seconds SDN is busy trying to allocate resources. You know, resource allocation is very short time scales, um, so microseconds and, and up in the, in the core and access. And interestingly, there's some time scales at which we've not built mechanisms. So there's, there's all kinds of under, unexploited um, uh, resource trades that exist inside networks and, and um, efficiency we aren't getting. And at every one of those time scales, we could be making a, a good or a bad resource trade. Okay? So if I take all the cell towers from Stockholm and put them in that field out there, with fabulous coverage for the cows, that's a bad resource trade. Yeah. If I take all the disappointment um, away from a uh, voice call and put it onto the overnight backup, that's generally good, but if it causes the overnight backup to fail, that's bad. Okay. So the picture of what, say, a typical IP core network looks like today is something like this, um, in terms of making good trades to bad trades, is we're pretty damn good at the capacity planning um, at long time scales. We're kind of working on this bit with SDM, um, we've, given this bit, we've given up on this bit, we've given all the trades out to the customers, TCP, and they arbitrage our networks for us. Um, and then we, we're kind of okay, As we get to very short time scales, we have these um, uh, course mechanisms and, and queues, which are kind of mostly making good trades, but some bad ones. Um, but as you can see, there's a lot of potential for improvement. Yeah, if we can get rid of the red and have more green. Um, and what's interesting about using Delta Q is that because it's a QRE proxy, we understand what the impact is on the customer of um, our trades. We can make good trades, as long as we have a good idea of what the customers want. Um, whereas if we're trying to trade bandwidth, that doesn't capture the timeliness requirement, and therefore we make bad trades. So just to prove that this um, isn't just a theory, um, my colleagues designed and built the world's first quality assured ISP in the UK. Um, and we'll be going to a commercial launch at some point. Uh, and um, so this is your typical trace over time of you know, delay on an um, existing DSL line. When you exploit all the existing trades, you can run about 90% of the traffic uh, as, as a kind of, I can't believe it's not TDM. Uh, but, but the disappointment has to go somewhere. So about 10% of the traffic has to run as a scavenger class, which, um, as you can see, gets worse quality than, than the old one. Uh, so we, we have to, if we want to have a sustainable industry, we have to engage with these resource trades and do rational ones. Otherwise, we have to run our networks incredibly empty. So to sort of start to wrap up and summarize, um, there's a, a new science that's emerging of network performance, and it lets us understand the boundary between what is feasible and what is infeasible, what's possible and impossible. So unlike the Comet 1, where the models of the system mis, uh, mispredicted where that boundary was, 
um, we want to have very accurate predictions of, of where that boundary is and, and how hard we can drive these systems. And Delta Q fills the k three key engineering gaps in the system. Uh, one is the metrics, which help us describe the predictable region operation. You know, how hard can I drive this thing? Second one is an algebra, which gives us the, the common language in which to talk about quality as an industry. And the third one is the calculus, which lets us do those predictable um, uh, trade-offs, so uh, architecture trade-offs at design time or uh, resource trade-offs at runtime. And the big prize is that if we, keep, if we follow the right uh, course, we can actually run networks in saturation. We can run them super profitable as well as good quality of experience to the customers. And it's a bit like the process we're going through. is a bit like the learning process we had with previous technologies. So with steam engines, we didn't understand how they really worked and the kinetic theory of gases until a long time after we built them. And we're at that stage now with networks, packet networks. We've been running them for decades. And now's the time to actually go back and fix some of the, the theoretical foundations, which is why you have people at the EU running these prizes. You know, cause we haven't got the, found, the, the theory isn't there. Um, so last slide. Um, there's a, uh, a basic science of the feasible, which we've been working on for many, you know, for a long time. So like Maxwell electromagnetism, you know, Turing computability, Shannon, you know, Hall, for these different aspects of our problem. But we've missed out one part, which is how do all those bits come together to create a, a distributed working system? Which gives us uh, the kind of predictability we take for granted everywhere else. So, um, if you want to learn more, get in touch. Uh, I have to unfortunately leave um, at 6 o'clock, so I can't stay for dinner tonight. Um, uh, the maths is non-proprietary, it's for everyone to use. <laughs> uh, and it and it's reflects the, the world in the same way that, say, Maxwell's wave equations reflect the world. So it's not like it's a neat good idea, it's kind of mandatory um, if, if we want to make progress. Good. Thank you. <coughs> All right, congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. You just did a course in uh, probability theory based on non-terminating processes. Uh, certificates will be handed off by uh, David at the end of the day. So um, don't run away because I actually would like you to answer some questions if you could please come back. It's not as easy as that, right? So you gave us some grilling on the math stuff. Now it's okay. time for them, right? Here we go. <laughs> Far away. Yeah, a couple. Th thank you. Uh, it's always refreshing to see a bit different kind of approaches to uh, uh, Anyway, fundamentally same kind of uh, problem. One, one, one uh, just generic question is that why can't you also name this as kind of added uh, positive end results for the customers? I, I, I think that you could also turn it that way and it, would, it, it could be made uh, to, to work uh, with same kind of principles. And uh, then, then uh, one, one thing is that um, you showed some practical examples. Mm -hmm. Are you able to put some monetary value on those? And then a third question is, is that uh, uh, as, as you said, that uh, you, you are then uh, is, is one one part of this then that uh, you are kind of shutting down part of the system if that's not needed. So so you're kind of always providing the bare minimum so that the, the customers are not too unsatisfied. Okay, so there's three questions there. Um, first question um, uh, was about negative versus positive framing of the world. And can, can we can we frame the world in a lovely positive way? Sorry, it's just the world isn't, it isn't, like, isn't like that. You know, the, the ideal network uh, does instant and perfect replication of information. Right? And all real networks are worse than that. Yeah, so um, it's just the nature of the reality of the world we live in is that's the right framing to, to adopt. It's like um, you know, electrons have a, you know, have a negative charge. It's like, well, that's the way the world is. You know, we might not like it, but it's like it just is. Um, how much is it worth? Okay, that's a really good question. Um, uh, there's three parts to that. So there's revenue, cost, and risk. Um, so revenue is that you can build quality assured services. So look at the difference in price between TDM circuit and uh, broadband line, very big. Um, you can generate the same, you can crack out the different qualities and generate the same revenue uh, from a different you know, product um, at a fraction of the cost. Um, in cost, uh, we reckon that if you exploit all those trades, if, if, you, if you exploit what is mathematically possible, there's about five to 10 years worth of slack growth inside most telecom networks that are running a mixture of elastic and inelastic traffic. So five to 10 years worth of capex-free growth exists inside the ne those networks. 
I'll let you put a number on it. Um, and in terms of risk, we've seen lots of infeasible projects. Um, so in small cells, RAN sharing, video on demand, uh, uh, unified comms, lots of things have gone wrong. Um, so again, you can put a number on how much those infe avoiding infeasible projects would be worth, but it's a, it begins with a B. Um, and the third question you had. So it, it <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm I'm uh, missing out that as well, but uh, uh, <laughs> it, it, it maybe we could hand over then yeah. to uh, maybe to David. Next question. Yeah. yeah. Martin, you gave the example, I think, of uh, Kent Council or something. K yeah, the, Kent, the Kent Public the Service Network. Sorry. And like in the middle of the night, there was that event which mm -hmm. potentially would make a VoIP service unstable. Yeah. What's the practical nature of being able to measure it and then actually being able to do something about it based on what you're presenting? Right. So, um, so, so it's an analysis to say there's something wrong, but I is there some... Is there some next step to fix that yes, problem? Yes, right. So um, uh, the, uh, what you're trying to do is understand, is it a problem that's due to the uh, static structure of the network? So if you're routing the traffic by Timbuk2, you know, that's a problem, yeah? which is, um, or is it a choice of technology? Yeah, so you've, you've got a, a one gig link and you need a 100 gig, gig link. Yeah, so is it the serialization time? So, so splitting out the G, the S, and the V tells us immediately, is it a architecture problem? Is it a... Um, uh, uh, or is it a, 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 a scheduling problem? Yeah. And, um, and then the spatial resolution tells us where in the network that the problem is. So um, we can see how the, the disappointment, the impairment accumulates along those paths, and we can understand the, the nature of the contract every boundary, and whether, whether they're the right contracts and whether they're being adhered to. Um, so I, it's I guess my question's a little more directed, and that's at yeah. 2 a.m. in the morning, you had that spike. Yeah. There was no other traffic, based on you know the other graph. How, how can you solve that problem? What, what happened? You, you how do you solve it? You, you, you need to schedule that, that traffic differently. So you need, you'd need to create some different classes of service um, so that uh, the voice traffic encountering that queue would, would not experience the, the the effect of the queue. Okay. So that, that was a scheduling problem. All right. Thanks again. Let's give Martin a hand and. Thank you.